All right, uh, welcome to the DDPA seminar, everyone. Let's go over some logistics. Uh, first, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. Uh, if you have questions, you are welcome to unmute and I ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences. Therefore, no classified discussion is allowed. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in, in our YouTube channel. Uh, that's about it. Now, let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Christopher uh, Au, um, who is a faculty member in the graduate fields of applied mathematics, and theoretical and applied mechanics, and civil and en environmental engineering at Cornell University. Um, personally, I, I got the um, uh, the bachelor's degree uh, in civil and engineering at Cornell University, so I'm I'm very fond of that place. And he is a professor in the Center uh, for Applied Mathematics and the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, he is research in applied mathematics and has a focus on inverse problems and scientific machine learning. He received his PhD from the University of Minnesota, uh, Twin cities and his uh, mass, uh, master, master's and bachelor's degrees from Virginia Tech. Uh, today, Chris will present an interesting topic, which is gaining mechanistic insight through learning Green's functions, uncovering the solutions to hidden PDEs. Please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button by um, button to Chris by asking one random question as usual. Uh, since Chris is from uh, Cornell, uh, Ithaca, New York, what is your favorite things to do in Ithaca? Uh, uh, running. I really enjoy trail running. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's it's wonderful place to run, uh, in, uh, yeah. especially in the, the campus at, at Cornell, right? It's just yeah, like, and, and during the fall too, it's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. Okay, well, it's all yours, Chris. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Young Su. It's uh, it's great to see uh, one of our uh, former students going on to do such wonderful things, and I deeply appreciate the uh, invitation to speak at the DDPS seminar. And I also appreciate everyone uh, listening. And as Young Su pointed out, I'm going to be discussing um, uh, how it is you can learn. Um, interesting things about your system uh, through the study of Green's functions that you uh, uncover. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about different ways that you might uncover these Green's functions. And so uh, it's similar in, in spirit to sort of PDE learning uh, and uh, various people have, have been important on the PDE learning front, Hod Libson at Columbia University, Steve Brunton and Nathan Cutts at University of Washington um, and uh, Hayden Schaefer, another Cornell alumnus at Carnegie Mellon University. But rather than learning the partial differential equation, what we want to do is learn linear um, solution operators, um, compact integral functions, integral kernels that um, that uh, give us a different way to uh, study and understand complex systems. And so other people have uh, looked at um, learning Green's functions in the past, notably uh, Lexing Ying at uh, in the math department at Stanford University. Uh, again, Steve Brunton and uh, and Nathan Cutts at University of Washington and their Deep Green paper. And then also um, some researchers in, uh, at Caltech have, a, have some research on this idea of a neural operator, which is inspired by Green's functions. Um, and that's Kaushik Bhattacharya, Andrew Stewart, and Anima Anand Kumar. And, uh, but what I'm gonna be presenting today is a, is a different take on on sort of even what what those folks have been doing, um, rather than trying to come up with sort of fast expressive surrogates for partial differential equations or solutions to partial differential equations, or uh, as stand in forward models, what we want to do is uh, have the computer be our partner in scientific discovery, um, you exploiting or leveraging its pattern recognition capabilities um, as a means for understanding um, uh, complexities and subtleties in the system by asking it to speak in a language that we understand, uh, the language of the universe or mathematics. And so um, the talk is divided into three parts today. It starts from how physics can inspire reduced order models and a just-in-time physics modality. 
um, then that led to uh, some thinking about how it is we might learn Green's functions in a non-SIML context. Uh, so this goes back to about 2012 before I was thinking about SIML uh, as a as a uh, interesting thing to pursue. And then uh, the final third of the talk will culminate in a uh, um, a use of deep rational networks uh, in helping us to uh, discover and understand. Uh, these uh, solution operators uh, or Green's functions that apply to some hidden mechanism at work in a system that we care about. And as with any research, um, I have a series of collaborators who I have to acknowledge and thank. And the first part of the talk um, related to reduced order models, um, this is conducted with a former PhD student of mine is now a postdoc at San Diego State University, Vasilios Fundulakis. And then the second part of the talk, uh, the empirical Green's function work is carried out with one of my doctoral students at the Center for Applied Mathematics, Max Jenklin, and the very talented Harsh Praveen, a doctoral student of mine at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And then the last third of the talk is a the newest work, and it's a collaboration between uh, a very talented doctoral student in mathematics at Oxford, Nicolas Boulet, and uh, my good friend in the math department at Cornell, Professor Alex Townsend. And so, uh, as I indicated, there are three major parts to this talk, uh, just enough physics, data-driven reduced order modeling piece, and then how that inspired this notion of learning what I call empirical Green's functions or Green's functions that are uh, distilled out of data that we see streaming from the response of our system. And then finally, um, how it is that we can extend this idea of empirical Green's functions to a much broader context through the use of deep learning. And that will uh, then conclude this, the talk today. And so um, the original idea that I had um, for sort of data inspired reduced order modeling came about as a result of some work we were doing for the Navy, the Office of Naval Research and the Topside Signatures Program. Uh, uh, the program officer for that is uh, Dr. Stephen Russell. And um, in that program, um, there was a desire to understand how it is that electromagnetic radiation propagates in the very complex environment that is the lower troposphere of our atmosphere as it impinges on the free surface of the ocean. And so this, um, this lovely photograph of this coastal setting, uh, I like to show because it highlights some important uh, aspects of the complexities that occur in this marine atmospheric boundary layer or MABEL. So to start with, we see that uh, this is the sun setting. And normally we would expect the sun to present itself as a disk. And clearly, uh, as a result of some interesting atmospheric uh, phenomenology, the disk is no longer a disk, but has cusps and discontinuities and other interesting features. Um, and furthermore, we see that there is a stratification in the coloring of the sun, if you notice this. And these features um, are harbingers of things to come uh, in the next couple of slides. So I ask you just to remember these features of stratification and strangeness that occurs uh, with respect to the refractive index as a result of the roiling mess that is the marine atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, there's you know, energy and mass fluxes between the free surface of the ocean and the lower atmosphere. It's very, very turbulent, complex uh, medium to study. So the Navy, um, was not interested in the optical uh, propagation properties in the Mabel, but rather they were curious about the performance of radar systems, uh, specifically in the X-band of the spectrum. And the X-band uh, presents in a frequency range that results in wavelengths uh, of the EM on the order of 10 centimeters or so. And so, <clears throat> you know, normally we could um, just simply discretize our domain um, and use uh, Maxwell's lovely uh, system of partial differential equations and have that, all that exquisite predictive power that's encapsulated in those simple expressions uh, to be able to make a propagation prediction, let's say, in some, in some domain of interest. But in the case of the Navy um, application, the domain of interest was a box that was 100 meters by 50 kilometers. And so uh, the level of discretization necessary for this domain was uh, pretty ambitious. Um, especially since the Navy wanted a faster than real time solution. And I'll explain what I mean by faster, real, faster than real time later, but it had to be done extremely quickly. And it just was um, impractical to think that you could 
um, solve a, a system this size, a dis discretized system this size in a faster than real time context. Additionally, um, how is it that you could sort of characterize all the subtle features of uh, refractivity changes um, point wise in a suitably discretized domain? Okay, so this is a challenging forward problem. Now, do it as an inverse problem. So what you want to do is then run that forward, query that forward solver as part of some sort of um, an optimization scheme uh, to arrive at uh, you know, a plausible solution to some observations you're seeing on a particular day. And it becomes even more difficult as you imagine running the forward solver tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of times. And so um, as somebody who really didn't know much about radar systems and had only a, a, an elementary level uh, understanding of electromagnetic propagation, um, I sort of thought about this as saying, you know what, uh, if I didn't have an atmosphere, I would have a very simple case where a, a receiver would inject electromagnetic radiation into one end of my box. It would propagate downrange and attenuate itself with an inverse square law. And at a suitably long distance away from the transmitter, the receiver would essentially see a plane wave. And so I asked the Navy, I said, look, what is it you really care about? What's your quantity of interest? And they said, of course, we can't tell you, but um, how about you play with this? And they said, why don't you tell us how distorted a wave would end up being downrange as a result of the presence of the marine atmospheric boundary layer? And so I had this thought that rather than studying every bit of um, subtlety at work in the forward modeling of the problem uh, that you might uh, carry along with the Maxwell solution, what if we just uh, carried enough physical insight uh, to make a, um, a, 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 a rough model that gave us a, a, quantity, a quantity of interest, a prediction on a quantity of interest in a way that was technologically useful? So motivated by that, I was thinking that this roiling mess of marine atmospheric boundary layer could sort of be integrated out um, in the spirit of a blurring operator like you might see in an imaging problem. And so the thought was, maybe there's an integral operator that can map the clean image into the blurry image, and um, we could use this as a point of departure. Additionally, we also know from experts, domain experts, that the marine atmospheric boundary layer has this stratified property. There are these layer-wise structures that present frequently in the um, in in this region of the lower atmosphere, and so maybe we can exploit that too in our just enough physics um, representation. So, again, reminding ourselves or mentioning again the idea of a blurring operator or. Uh, uh, sort of how it is that a point spread function might be applied to a clean image. So let's say that this is the clean image and this is a point spread function like a Gaussian blur or Moffat blur. And then we integrate over the clean image with this blurring operator and end up with some blurry image. And that's what you would do in a normal uh, image blurring problem. But what now if instead we said, okay, what if we took the propagation um, uh, propagation factors in the downrange setting that we measured, okay, the energy deposited into the box and said that was our, without an atmosphere and said that was our clean image. And then the effect of the marine atmospheric boundary layer would be in some blurring operator such that we would see what the receiver sees on a particular day when an observation is made. But now, rather than having a small support translation invariant kernel operator like you would have for a point spread, um, in an imaging problem, I have my kernel function supported over the entire stratified domain of the marine atmospheric boundary layer, layer by layer. And so then the, the, the kernel function is expressing what the marine atmospheric boundary layer does to a vacuum propagation case and turns it into something that looks real. And this is a Friedholm kernel. And so Friedholm integral theory says, ah, there's a spectral decomposition of the kernel function in terms of its uh, complex, the complex conjugate of the eigenfunction times the eigenfunction divided by the eigenvalues. Great, but you can't go to the atmosphere and say, hey, what are your eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, right? That's just not gonna be a, a thing that uh, is uh, feasible. And so what if we replace these orthonormal bases, orthogonal bases, these eigenbases, excuse me, with data uh, or empirical eigenbases or empir uh, empirical eigenfunctions, okay, POD modes. So if we 
sort of stare at the response of our uh, marine atmospheric boundary layer in time, we can collect an ensemble of data from which we can then extract POD modes. These modes then could be used to approximate a blurring operator that uh, basically is a stand-in for what the atmosphere is doing. Furthermore, we might have some salient physical parameters that are um, useful in characterizing the environment we're seeing ourselves in on a particular day in the Mabel. It could be something like uh, relative humidity, temperature, barometric pressure, so it could be a vector. In any event, we can then take these orthonormal bases and place them onto some uh, suitable manifold um, in a nonlinear context, okay? And um, we might have sort of a series of library entries, environments that we were able to, in our time, at leisure and in safety, collect data at, okay, particular theta values, a nice theta one day, a theta two day, a theta three day, and so on. And we have these bases learned and we store them on a manifold. And then someday we find ourselves in a dangerous situation where we have to quickly figure out what kind of marine atmospheric boundary layer do we have today? And I need to know fast. So then maybe we interpolate from the ones we've seen uh, in, in nice times to this place where we are during a dangerous time and make an approximation of how um, the, what the EM weather is like on that particular day. And so how would you collect data to build these uh, empirical eigenfunctions? So if we think of uh, creating an ensemble on a theta one weather day, okay, our Mabel is in theta one situation, a theta two situation, a theta M situation, then I could take measurement realizations, measurement one, measurement two, measurement three, measurement four. And one way to think about this would be that these measurements are scintillations on a, variations on a theta one theme. And a way to think about this is imagine you're cooking out on your deck and you're looking at your backyard. So there's the vista of your backyard, okay? And your, your grill is hot and you look over your grill and sort of this the buoyant, uh, buoyant uh, transfer of mass from the heated air up into your field of view creates these like heat waves, I guess we call them colloquially, uh, but they're density changes that impact refractivity. So you see sort of this wavy image of your backyard. That's scintillation one. Another realization would be scintillation two, scintillation three. Each of these are analogous to the snapshot you might see of your backyard, which theta one. You look in a different direction and that maybe is theta m, okay? So you have these ensembles of data collected and you take uh, an SVD and you end up with a, um, a uh, hmm. that didn't work, sorry. You end up with a um, you end up with uh, left singular vectors that you can then use for your proper orthogonal modes, okay? And so we see that sort of down here. And uh, this is a cartoon of the manifold interpolation. Um, so uh, in in our case, we're using something called the compact steeple manifold, and we represent our bases um, for our library in blue, and we lift these to some flat space a tangent space where we can do an interpolation and then restrict back down to a point that we would like to know something about, a just-in-time basis that would characterize our marine atmospheric boundary layer. And this idea of manifold interpolation is not new. Uh, lots of people have used it before. Uh, Sharbal Farhat and uh, Chris Anselm wrote a paper a while back in AIA journal. And before that, there were, uh, this was in the differential geom geometry literature. And, but the reason I'm showing the algorithm here is just to point out to you that this is a thin SVD that gives you the logarithmic lift to the tangent space and then the exponential restriction back from the tangent space to the uh, complex steeple manifold is also involving a thin SVD. This is very efficient to calculate or compute using modern numerical um, libraries. And so um, it ends up being uh, the solution that's in this paper that we wrote in the IEEE transactions, which the sciences and remote sensing is a faster than real time solution for characterizing the marine atmospheric boundary layer. And faster than real time means our characterization of the marine atmospheric boundary layer is carried out on a scale that's much shorter than the scale by which the marine atmospheric boundary layer evolves from state to state. So we characterize it more quickly than the time necessary for it to change to a new state. 
and that's what uh, that's what the aim was. But the reason I'm most excited about sharing this with you is it kind of inspired an idea in me. I started looking at the form of this equation, and I started thinking, you know, this kind of reminds me of a Green's function. If I put a source term here and I have an impulse response, then I could get the solution to a partial differential equation. So if I can do this as a just-in-time physics model, maybe I could learn the solution of a hidden PDE governing a system uh, for which I would like to know something about. And so moving on to that setting, um, if we switch gears now and think about some sort of a system a partial, that's described by a partial differential equation, um, we have some linear differential operator L um, acting on, and, and for the sake of what I'm gonna say now, I'll just say a scalar field to you uh, to produce a source term F, okay? So generally speaking, a, a Green's function is a classical solution where you take the source term, integrate against this thing called a Green's function, and you end up getting the solution to the linear differential operator for which G is a right inverse, okay? And so this G is essentially a, a linear point, a linear impulse response function. And so um, you can, in some cases, you can find these uh, through inspiration or through tricks, but other times they're hard to find. And so um, it's kind of interesting to see if you can learn these uh, through data from your system. And so also with this manifold interpolation idea, there's this potential to extend the Green's function notion to nonlinear regimes by essentially sort of learning locally linear patches on the Riemannian manifold and having a Green's function in the patch and then another patch and another patch and sort of leapfrogging around the parameter space of the, uh, of the solutions using uh, connections, affine connections of a certain type, levy chudita connections. Okay, so how would you do this? So first of all, how would you collect data for a system? Okay, so let's say that there, we, we hypothesize that there's a partial differential equation at work in our system and we wanna learn its solution. Okay, we don't wanna learn its PDE, we wanna learn its solution operator. So it could be that we're stuck. It could be that we have to live with whatever uh, the system is telling us. So it could be that we're just passively watching stuff happen to the system, cause, going on to the system and the system responding effect, cause and effect data from the system. And maybe we have no control over, we just have to live with whatever it gives us, okay? In that restricted situation, you would not learn a good Green's function. You would learn a restricted Green's function that corresponds to whatever sub, subset of the co-image uh, for the linear differential operator you're taking observations from, okay? So you wouldn't be able to see the entire Green's function, you'd only be able to see a narrow piece of it because that's all the system is being excited to show you. So in the results I'm going to show subsequently, we actually excite our system using random draws from a Gaussian process with a, with a small kernel function. And that essentially means that our source terms are like wiggly spaghetti, okay? They have lots of zero crossings and we, we hit our system with those the system responds and we collect responses under these random draws from some Gaussian process. Now you think, why the heck a Gaussian process? And that's a fair question. And I'm gonna ask you to please bear with me until I get further into the talk and I'll explain where that came from, that idea of using a Gaussian process to excite the system, okay? But in any event, we excite, we can ex if we can't control it, we'll take whatever excitation we can get and watch a response. If we can excite it, it would be great if we could excite with something high frequency like Gaussian processes with small, with uh, with small, with uh, tight covariance kernels. Um, then if we assume that our linear differential operator is self-adjoint, which is a very important assumption, okay, then our construction of the Green's function follows that same Friedholm spectral decomposition that I used in the just-in-time physics example. And so this is a serious limitation. You know, the PDE has to be self-adjoint uh, for us to learn in this way. But a lot of important uh, PDEs in the natural sciences are self-adjoint. And so it might be okay. Um, in the last third of the talk, we'll relax this requirement, okay? But for now, we need it to be uh, self-adjoint. And so in space, the POD modes are tracking the response, the spatial response. And 
what I'm showing in the subsequent results are they're basically spatial PDEs. If we needed to add the, the time variable or space and time, um, one easy way to do it would be to let the POD modes still uh, sort of uh, track the spatial response and then let the coefficient, diagonal coefficient matrix sigma K have a time dependence. And so either at every time step, we fit a new sigma K or um, in a slowly evolving system, we might hit it epoch by epoch by epoch, updating the sigma K. And how do you update a sigma K and what does that mean? Well, basically we have a loss function that we want to satisfy. And so what we have are observations from our system and predictions under our spectrally composed or constructed greens function. We know the POD modes from the data. What we don't know are the coefficient, the diagonal coefficient matrices that give us a suitable greens function approximation. So the way we arrive at this is by argmining a an average least squares in an average least squares sense over possible diagonal coefficient matrices. And once we have a suitable error tolerance achieved, we call that our Z, our, our, our coefficient matrix, okay, that corresponds to these POD modes to give us a good approximation to a Green's function. And that's it, okay? So there's no machine learning here. It's just a simple uh, data-driven Green's, empirical Green's function discovery process. But how well does it do? Well, if we do the hello world of PDEs, we can look at Poisson's equation with homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. And in this particular case, we know the Green's function. So we can sort of see how well we do. And so the Green's function we learned from the data is shown on the left for the Poisson problem. And then the true Green's function from the analytical form is presented on the right. And we see that the relative error is somewhat modest, 0 0.01. Um, and so it seems pretty good for us uh, to our minds. Uh, but then this is noise free. What if we add some noise? How well does it do? And so we added what we thought was a lot of noise. So we took every sensor measurement where a snapshot value was collected, one each per column of our ensemble and contaminated it with IID Gaussian white noise whose standard deviation was the average response of the entire data ensemble. So it seems like that's a pretty significant amount of noise contamination and the error did grow between the, the empirically discovered and the ground truth uh, to be three times larger than it was before, but still the relative error is only 0 0.03. So it's, it's fairly modest again. Okay, what if we try Hemholtz equation? Um, it's another PDE where we have an analytical form. And so for this is the square root of our eigenvalue uh, for Hemholtz at 15 on the, on the unit interval uh, with Dirichlet homogeneous boundary conditions again. And we can compare to see how well our um, constructed Green's function or our learned empirical Green's function does compared to the true Green's function. And once again, we see a modest relative error at 0.03. And we can do this for Aries equation in 1D with theta equals 10. And in this case, we don't really have an analytical form, but this is what the method uncovers. And we see some very interesting structures that are present in the Green's function besides the anti-symmetry uh, that's consistent with the self-adjoint operator. And so um, I'll talk more about what these symmetries might mean uh, later in the talk. But we could also um, do, let's say, a multi-physics context uh, where we combine Poisson and Hemholtz. Uh, so one quarter of the domain is Hemholtz and the other three quarters are Poisson. And our snapshot then is a collection of this multi-physics behavior. And what then would we learn? And we, we do see structure in the learn greens function uh, that is indicative of a diffusion operator in the top right, and something that is very reminiscent of Hemholtz in the bottom left. And so, you know, it, it, it's interesting that, you know, when you have multiple physical, uh, dominant physical mechanisms at work, there is, uh, there is shadows of this present in the Green's functions that you'd learn uh, with this method. Um, we can also move to higher dimensions. Instead of being on 1D, this is the 2D unit disk with, uh, for Poisson. 
And we have, again, an exact greens function for this case. And what you see are slices through the learned empirical greens function versus the analytical form and a different slice through the cross section of the empirical greens function versus the uh, true ground truth case that's analytically available to us. And, but then what about this idea of interpolation? Can we interpolate these empirical greens functions to find greens functions at places where we have no data? So here is a Aries equation in 1D. And for the first Aries equation, we're considering a theta value of one. For the second Aries equation, we're considering a theta value of five and the third equation, a theta value of 10. What we want to do is find the greens function at a value, theta value of seven, but not learn from data. We want to put it up on the manifold, interpolate our bases to the seven location and reconstruct the greens function there just in time, data free. Okay. And so we use manifold interpolation on the POD modes and we use Lagrangian polynomials on the diagonal uh, coefficient matrices to perform the linear interpolation there. And so we see that the character of the Green's functions at theta equals one, theta equals five, and theta equals 10 are very different. So our three library entries that we're going to be interpolating are each quite different. And so when we interpolate to this new location seven, we see that our uh, learned empirical Green's function is very close to the target uh, Green's function when we when we actually learn it from data. Okay, so we, we minimize our loss function. We ge we actually generate data from the theta equals seven case, and we build a Green's function. So this is the built Green's function versus the interpolated Green's function, and the agreement between the two is uh, 0 0.04, the rel and relative error. So we feel that that's a reasonable. Um, a reasonably good approximation uh, for this type of interpolation when you're not using the data to build the Green's function. But you're still restricted. You're limited to cases where, you know, you're a self-adjoint partial differential operator, okay? So what if we want to relax that? So this work is the work between uh, Nicola Boulay and Alex Townsend and I, and um, it, it, this is now where we move into the realm of scientific machine learning, okay? So in this particular context, we're expressing our, our solution, the scalar value, this is, you know, we have vector valued results I'll show you later, but this is a solution to some uh, linear partial differential operator. And we have our Green's function being integrated against a source term to produce part of the solution. And then we have what we call the homogeneous solution, which is the effects of boundary conditions other than homogeneous Dirichlet, and other types of interface conditions that can be injected into the solution, okay? So each one of these, the G and the U homogeneous are their own separate neural networks, okay? And I'll explain more about this in a moment. But for now, I want to tell you that we excite our systems using draws from a Gaussian process, okay? A GP. And I told you I was gonna tell you why. And so, one of the reasons that we're doing this is because uh, Nicola and Alex have a, um, a lovely theoretical paper, uh, Learning Elliptic Partial Differential Equations with Randomized Linear Algebra, it's available on the archive, uh, where they uh, guarantee that if you oversample, um, that you get a rank K approximation uh, almost surely, uh, a best rank K approximation almost surely, if you oversample by some small p, as long as your, um, with high probability, as long as your um, covariance kernel satisfies certain requirements, okay? And so basically you want the, the, the spaghetti in your uh, Gaussian process to be very wiggly. Um, and the more wiggly it is, the fewer training pairs you need uh, to be able to train the neural network. And the results I'm gonna show from here forward, we're only gonna using a hundred training pairs uh, to get these results, okay? Um, and uh, so the GP motivation for the GP excitations is in the paper by uh, Nicola and Alex. And the other subtlety uh, that, uh, that's important to point out is that the deep networks that we're learning to um, uncover G, the Green's function and the homogeneous solution, they are what are called rational neural networks. And these rational neural networks were developed by Nicola um, 
and Nakatsukasa and also Townsend in this paper, Rational Neural Networks, that's also available on the archive. It's the last entry on the bottom of this slide. Um, and these uh, rational neural networks are very, very powerful and helpful to us as we try to glean physical insight into what's going on mechanistically within our system. And I'll, I'll show why in a minute. But essentially what's happening is the activation functions in the neural network, typically like ReLU, hyperbolic tangent, we're replacing those by three, two rational functions, okay? And it's a constant rational function per hidden uh, layer, okay? So every hidden unit in a hidden layer uses the same three, two rational activation function. So it doesn't add a lot of free parameters to the model. Okay, so as a cartoon, here's what we're doing in this uh, most generalized example of learning Green's functions. We take a carefully constructed covariance kernel and we take random draws random spaghetti out of the uh, Gaussian process. We use these random draws as excitations on some unknown system, and we watch how the system behaves under these random draws. These, this collection of cause and effect data then are the training data that we use to train two rational deep neural networks, one for the Green's function and one for the homogeneous solution. These both are trained off of the same loss function inspired by this equation, which is the solution is the superposition of the homogeneous and the Green's function uh, integration. So we have a superposition of the homogeneous and the Green's function uh, integration compared with the response solution and normalized. Okay. At the end of this, the networks contain Green's functions and homogeneous uh, solutions respectively, and then we extract those into a visual form that we can interpret as human beings, okay? And this is a semantically rich form for us, and it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's an abstract mathematical quantity that has deep meaning to us, and we can study things about uh, what we're seeing. Specifically, if we have now the Green's function and the homogeneous solution, we can look for symmetries, conservations, invariants that all are present in the Green's function that tell us important things about the linear differential operators that then also tells us something mechanistically important about the physical system. Partial differential equations are the language of our natural world. If we understand things about the solutions to these partial differential equations, we understand something about what's going on in that system. So there's a, there's a hint of mechanism in, in things that we're seeing in the solutions that we're learning. We also have the opportunity to watch how it is that the eigenvalues decay um, within our solutions and also what the dominant eigenmodes of the Green's function uh, solutions are. Furthermore, the use of the rational neural networks gives us yet another tool for physical insight. When we look at the clustering of the poles of the rational approximant, they tend to cluster at locations of singularity in the actual, pro uh, the actual function that is being approximated. So the solution to the PDE um, is, have, may have a singularity in it and the rational poles will cluster at the location of that singularity giving us, and we can study the nature of that singularity. Okay, so how well does this work? So here's the, the classic self-adjoint case that I've been showing you. So this is the exact analytical form of the Green's function for the 1D Poisson case. And here's the reproduction using the deep neural network. Okay, it looks great. So what? We've already done this. Okay, so now we're going to a non self adjoint case. And so here we see advection diffusion. And in the advection diffusion case, we have an analytic Green's function and a learned Green's function. And we see that the deep rational neural network is able to do a very good job to the eyeball norm at reconstructing this, uh, this Green's function. And we can do this in two dimensions as well. So here's the exact on the 2D. Uh, disk, unit disk for Poisson's equation. Here's the exact Green's function to slices. And here's a learned Green's function uh, for those same slices. There's a little bit of noise in this in these reconstructions because our grid was uh, fairly coarse. And this was uh, as a result of some computational issues that we were having in terms of not having access to a powerful enough computer at that moment. Uh, another interesting example would be um, what I want to call your attention to on this top line. This top line is an advection diffusion, 1D advection diffusion problem whose coefficient functions are such that a viscous shock forms at the mid-domain mid, uh, mid 
of the problem. Okay. And so when we learn the Green's function with this problem, we see that there is a concentration of energy sort of at the midpoint of the domain, and we have uh, reflexive symmetry across the Green's function. I, additionally, the homogeneous solution clearly shows the step function uh, property of the shock. And when we look at the phase portrait of the rational neural networks, we see the poles of the rational functions clustering right to the real line at the exact location where the, um, where the uh, singularity is in the solution. Okay, so how robust is this approach when we don't have a lot of data? How robust is it to data sparsity? So let's be diabolical. Let's put two black lines in our domain and exclude any data from in and around the shock front in this, uh, in this advection diffusion problem, okay? And only learn the stuff outside the shock front. And if we do that, the Green's function we recover is a very good approximation to the true Green's function. Reflexive symmetry is still present. There is a concentration of energy in the shock region. And we also see that the homogeneous solution is able to recreate the stepwise properties of of the discontinuity. And still, the rational poles cluster to the real line at the location of the singularity in the problem of interest. And then the last one is sort of this multi-physics context where we have diffusion in one portion of the domain and advection in the other portion of the domain. And we clearly see um, the, the Green's function of the diffusion operator, self-adjoint, and the non-self-adjoint advection operator presenting themselves quite clearly to the eye. Um, and the Green's function, the homogeneous solution agrees well, and the rational poles converge to the real line at the location of the transition in the physics. And so that's also a helpful clue as to something interesting going on in the problem. And we can even sort of tackle weakly nonlinear cases. So what we have here is the Helmholtz, sturm liouville and biharmonic operators, um, which are themselves linear but we add to them a, uh, a semi-linear, uh, we make them semi-linear in that the leading, the, the higher order, highest order derivative, the leading term and the partial differential equation is still linear, but the, tr the lower order terms are nonlinear. And in this case, they're uh, cubically nonlinear uh, with an epsilon parameter where epsilon is a value between zero and one. So some people would call this weakly nonlinear, some people call this semi-linear. Um, it's nonlinear, but not really, really nonlinear, if that's uh, imprecise enough for you. <laughs> that's how I like to think of it. And so what you end up doing is you end up learning sort of a locally linear approximation to um, Hemholtz, sturm liouville and Biharmonic in their semi-linear states. Okay, and we believe that this is important so you can get some mechanistic insight from what it is that's going on in your system at a certain uh, parameter value uh, by looking at this locally linear representation. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that we can tackle systems. Um, so here we have um, a Stokes flow example. So Stokes flow is a system of partial differential equations, velocity and pressure uh, coupled. So this is uh, an incompressible Newtonian context where there's a no slip boundary on these three walls where my cursor is um, tracing out and a constant velocity field across the top. Some people call this the lid driven cavity benchmark problem in CFD codes, okay? And the exact velocity versus a learned velocity is a good agreement. The learned velocity is what we get from running our learned Green's function um, against the source terms, and we get a, a excellent fidelity to the exact solution. But what is most interesting for our purposes is this block matrix of Green's functions. So we have sort of these dominant diagonal terms uh, and these cross terms, which represent the coupling. And so we can tackle systems of partial differential equations, uh, the result of which is uh, sort of a block matrix of, of Green's functions themselves. And another way to sort of see this more clearly is with ordinary linear differential operators. Uh, so we have here two second order ODEs that are coupled with uh, sort of uh, some, some simple little boundary conditions. And we can then learn the Green's functions for these guys. And what we see is we see the nice diffusion operation, uh, diffusion solution that's occurring on the 1-1 and the 2-2 block. 
and the cross blocks are the coupling effects and uh, the homogeneous solutions for the two cases are also reproduced here. Okay, so uh, systems are also possible um, with this uh, deep learning approach using rational neural networks. And so um, there's a lot of examples that I didn't have time to talk about, and they're available in our uh, paper on the archive. Uh, uh, it's data-driven discovery of physical laws with human understandable deep learning. Um, and so I invite you to look at that if you're interested. Um, additionally, if you want to see a, even more examples that are in the paper, um, you can visit greenlearning.readthedocs.io. And if you'd like to try out some of these techniques, um, they're very easy to use, truthfully. Um, if you'd like to try some of these out yourself, um, it's written, in, or you can visit uh, Nicola's uh, GitHub repo under uh, green learning, and you'll see uh, sort of Python code and uh, the ML implementation is in TensorFlow. So if you're comfortable with TensorFlow, uh, that's how it's currently set up. Um, so I would invite you to um, play around with those. And, um, you know, I, as a final thought, I guess I would just say that um, I really believe that there's a lot of opportunity for a partnership to emerge between uh, sort of computers with machine learning algorithms running on them and us as scientists trying to understand our natural and technological world. I feel like the, the computers have this uh, very important capability of uh, untangling, divining, untangling things, divining out subtle patterns and uh, seeing things that are hard for us to see. But at the same time, we need to make them speak our language. And, and it's not just our language, it's the language that seems to permeate the universe, the language of math. And not just ones and zeros in addition and subtraction, but complex math, higher math. So having the computers be able to, uh, be us, having there to be a partnership with the computers seems to be a very fruitful direction to move in as we push the frontiers of uh, scientific inquiry. And so we're very passionate about that in my group and, uh, and uh, hope to continue working on this for quite some time. And with that, I would just say thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them now, or you can, if you think of them later, please feel free to email me. Um, but thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the great talk. Uh, thumbs up. Uh, really, really great talk. I loved it. Um, let's, thank you. <laughs> let's have a um, Q&A session. Um, oh, wow. Great. Um, Rob has asked what ended up happening with the uh, radar project. Ah, so um, we continued, the radar project continued for quite a while. Uh, over many years, and we 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 started with this faster than real time sort of just in time physics idea. Then we moved to a normal mode approximation idea, and then we moved to a uh, a couple of different machine learning uh, approaches with deep networks and convolutional neural networks. And so we we pursued many different flavors of faster than real time inversion schemes. And um, I honestly, so now we're done. So we, I think we had four projects uh, doing different things. And um, I, I don't know exactly if anything is being used. Uh, you know, it's tough to know, right? Because uh, this, this is a, they, they sort of give you, you know, you give, you're given a, a problem that is kind of vanilla and generic. And then um, you do your thing and you publish your results and maybe someone's using it behind the scenes and you just don't know about it. So I, ho I hope somebody's using it so I feel better about um, doing the work, but it could be that no one is using it. Certainly there are some papers about it. And if you uh, visit our website, you'll, you can find those papers if you're interested. Okay, sounds good. Um, Charlie asked, is the shock uh, formation example you showed similar to self-supervised learning? Self-supervised learning. Um, not really, because you have training data, right? So it's, uh, unless I'm misunderstanding about uh, what you mean by self-supervised learning, but I feel I, we definitely have training. Oh, you mean with the data missing? With the data missing that piece okay. or are you talking? Yeah, he said yes. Uh, yes, the, the data missing ah. because, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was, um, I'm really surprised that he was able to pick up the shock so well. 
We, we were too. And so I thought yeah, I you have so little data, right, to infer from it. And how does it know where to put the the, the, the discontinuity, right? That's that, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think a lot of this, uh, and I can't recall if, uh, if Nicole. I think Nicole is on the on the uh, in the meeting, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it has to do with the really powerful approximating capabilities of the rational neural network. So there's enough of a shadow of the signal from the shock in the areas where the you know the side measurements were made that it was able to fit a rational function through that. And I don't know, Nicola, are you still out there? He might, yeah, he might uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's it, yeah, it's correct. It's because it has good approximation outside of this missing data. It kind of find a good interpolant bit in between that is like kind of the most simple way to up interpolate between these points. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Yeah, sounds like rational neural network is pretty powerful. Uh, makes me curious about that. Yeah, yeah. Good All paper. Right. All right, next question is um, um, again by Rob. Um, he asked, what networks approaches did you try uh, that didn't work at all? Uh, what neural network approaches? I, I think so. Yeah. Ah, so that I don't have an answer to. I, I, I believe we just started with rational networks. We, in the paper, we tried ReLU and we tried other activation functions. But we generally, what we were, um, uh, how should we say, encouraged by was we use the same four layer 50, four hidden layer 50 hidden unit network across all examples and never had, we just ran, basically randomly selected it and never adjusted it. And it just always worked. And so um, that was one of the other things we found very startling about this approach was how robust it was to the architecture itself. Um, we never played with the architecture. Uh, it, we just used the same thing every time. And, and that, these are the results. And so there was no uh, cherry picking, uh, no games played. It was just yeah. random draw but, and that's what we wanted. Yeah, it looks like uh, Rob has his personal experience with a rational network and he um, whenever he uses the uh, in gradient descent, it it fails um, to resolve the, uh, the near the singularity. Um, I guess Rob, you can uh, add more details about your uh, past ex experience um, if you are connected to the, connected to the sounds, maybe. Nicola, do you have any thoughts on that? That to me, that doesn't sound like anything we experienced. Do you remember seeing anything like that? Uh Maybe because in the paper we used a, a second order optimizer as well, which is uh, takes advantage of the smoothness of functional neural network to do the optimization. So it is able to converge to a much better local minima than uh, gradient descent. Oh, so yeah, we we thanks Nicole. So we we're, we're combining uh, Adam with LB LBFGS uh, and during the optimization scheme. Okay. Well, I, I I hope Rob and you guys can be reconnected um, um, uh, after this talk. And uh, that sounds the... great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that would be wonderful. Uh, uh, I have a question. Another question. Sorry. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. What's I mean, this is fantastic. It's really great work. And I'm just kind of wondering what's the next steps for moving forward with this, you know, with this new tool, and how do you plan to scale this up? Like, well, for that, I have I have suggestions actually. Um, how about the Schrodinger Sh 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 uh, equations? That that is a linear, uh, and I'm not sure how you know the Green's functions is, is the analytic Green's function is available, or uh, maybe we can. So, so it, yeah, yeah. In, in the in the supplemental material uh, for the paper out on archive, we do do Schrodinger's equation. Um, oh, you yeah, and so there's a there's an example that I would invite you to take a peek at, uh, but maybe uh, in answering Charlie's question, I would say that currently what we're doing um, is to try to see if we can learn something new about real from real systems, and so we're 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 looking at uh, collaborators uh, 
both on the biosciences and also, um, well, basically in life sciences and biosciences, we're looking at, at applications that are related to the flight of birds and also um, the metabolic behaviors of uh, microbes. And so we just kind of want to see if we can actually learn something new for a change. Like we, we, we rediscovered, we rediscovered <laughs> solutions to PDEs or rediscovered solutions that didn't even previously know about to PDEs. But what if we try it with system data, actual system data, what could we, what could we find out? And so that's kind of where we're moving at in, in, in this, at this juncture. Okay. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks, Charlie. On another another suggestion suggestions for the the future work um, is the investigating the scalability of, of of your method so that it can be apply, applicable to larger scale problem. Usually, um, you know, at, from the perspective of national lab, uh, what we are usually dealing with is a huge problem. Um, so, you know, eight, using HPC and you know making the algorithm scalable that's kind of one of the big issue. Um, here, so it's fantastic. It's fantastic that um, your uh, your um, the, your work is working really well. Uh, but um, you know, the, for the future uh, directions, uh, it might be really even more fantastic if we can make it scalable so that uh, we can apply that to larger scale problem. Any any comments on that, Chris? Uh, I think you know we. Uh, Nicola, we, we, we bumped into some uh, scalability issues when we were looking at systems, and it was primarily related to uh, GPUs and uh, what kinds of systems we had. And we really didn't try to access, uh, we had very modest systems, and we were able to do you know things like you saw with the lid driven cavity and so forth. But if you want to do um, you know, much, much bigger systems, there's you know access to GPU computing um, is a must, uh, to be able to tackle bigger problems. And I think that's a common, uh, problem with, uh, with most, with most, uh, machine learning, uh, problems these days. Uh, the issue, you know, the question also is how scalable is sort of these off the shelf, uh, TensorFlow and Torch libraries, you know, are they truly the state of the art or are they open source insured because they're kind of fun to use, but they're like, you know, Google and Facebook have their own stuff, you know, hidden away that's even more efficient. I don't know. Um, but that's a, certainly a question that goes into the, uh, you know, obviously, you know, DeepMind is doing things with protein folding and, you know, uh, what are they using to do these enormous uh, machine learning runs and how are those scaling? Um, you know, that I, I don't know if they're using straight TensorFlow or not or how they're doing it. Um, so. I'm not sure that I can answer this question beyond saying that I think you need to deploy, like if we were just to use the libraries that we have now and deploy them on GPUs, we could tackle much, much bigger problems. But, you know, how scalable are they? I really couldn't say at this point. Um, Nicola is the, uh, the the man with the plan when it comes to the implementation. So maybe he can uh, add something that I'm missing. Nicola, is that true? Yeah, it's already running on GPUs, but we, we don't have large uh, access to GPUs, but the, the method itself uh, should support uh, things like domain decomposition and all sort of optimization we could do to, to scale up our problem. We could easily do domain decomposition later. Nice, nice. Um, I mean, it, at Lawrence Livermore, we do have a um, huge GPU machine, so let's probably, you know, future collaboration would be wonderful. That would be fantastic. Very happy to explore that. All right, sounds good. Okay, any other questions from audiences? No? Okay, so well, then with that, uh, let's thank um, the Chris uh, for the wonderful talk again, and also his students, Nicola, <laughs> to answering the questions. And thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And um, I hope this, you know, the seminar talk uh, is becoming a first the bridge you know for the future collaboration between you know a, a lot of external forces and Lawrence Lomo forces with you, you your uh, the research team Chris um, that would be wonderful I'd be very happy to explore anything like that that would be a great answer thank you thank you all right thank, thank, you, thank so you so much again thank you okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.